Why was Russia so robust against, not initially, but eventually so robust against pushing back against the Germans? Despite losing tens of millions of soldiers, the government doesn't collapse like the czars did in World War I. And not only that, but a communist country is able to produce these really advanced tanks in large and reliable numbers. There's so many mysteries there, like why central planning worked, why the government didn't collapse, despite the fact that Stalin, you know, killed off so many of his people, he would have been hated, right? So Ah, but Hitler killed more and was more hated. Uh, what you're thinking about is what did the Russians do? I'm going to flip it. So what did the Germans do? A useful concept comes from the Samuel Griffiths translation of Sun Tzu, which talks about death ground. What's death ground? It's when your enemy puts you on death ground, which means they're going to kill you. And therefore, you have no choice but to fight. Because if you don't fight, you're dead. And even if you fight, your odds are poor, but at least that's the only way you're going to get out. The Ukrainians initially welcomed the, the Germans. Why? Because Stalin and friends had imposed the uh, terrible famine of the early 1930s on them. And they couldn't imagine that anything would be worse than that until they met Nazis who then had them dig their own mass graves. The Ukrainians rethought that whole thing. And if you do this to people, you will conjure a formidable enemy. So that's what happened to Russia. You can see it happening to Ukraine now before your eyes. Go back uh, before the invasion of Crimea in 2014. You've got Ukraine, which has a very corrupt government. And people were at sixes and sevens about whether they want to do Ukrainian things or Russian things. Okay, fast forward to now where you have Russians blowing away the people who were most loyal to them in the eastern part of the country who didn't leave. Their apartment buildings are being leveled by Russians. Ukrainians think, aha, you know, this idea that we can coexist with these people is over. And, and our irony is Putin's forging Ukrainian national identity. And wars often do this. In the United States, uh, we start out with our 13 colonies, and they're all very different. After the Revolutionary War, that starts forging a national identity. And by the time you get to the end of the Civil War, where you have northern armies, at least those people have been all over the country, they have a real sense of nation by the end of that one. It's interesting because the strategy we pursued with Germany and Japan was unconditional surrender. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think of that as different than, obviously we didn't <laughs> commit genocide or anything, but do you think of that as different than the sort of uh, total unlimited policy objectives that, for example, Germany had in uh, Ukraine or Japan had in China? Uh, or in the, in the, we also pursued unconditional surrender against the South in the Civil War, right? So how, how do you think about, because that's also something where your back is up against the wall. Why did that not result in the same kind of morale? Because... The United States did not put the people of these countries on death ground. The leadership had self put themselves on death ground by where the, basically uh, the problem for Tojo Hideki is if he backs down on anything, he's out of office and then he doesn't know what happens after that. So he personally is on career death ground and possibly he thinks, uh, well, we, we, we were planning to, that he would get executed at the end of the war. But the Japanese people... Uh, eventually figured out that they weren't on death ground. And in fact, the Japanese people were so exhausted by the whole thing that they, the society shattered. Um, but the United States was never uh, going to put the German people, start massacring them in the way that the Russians massacred the Poles when they moved in, the Germans massacred the Poles. How do you wind up with eight or nine million Polish deaths in World War II? Think about that. It's a large number. It's because they're massacring. They're being massacred. But there was a firebombing of, you know, Tokyo and Dresden and yes. Berlin. I think it was in your book that 84,000 people died in that one night yes. of firebombing in Tokyo. Yes. It's terrible. Why did that not make them, put them in the mind frame of a sort of total uh, death ground? Well, A, I don't know. But B, Japan had been at war since 1931 in China. Uh, they'd been sending large armies. This isn't like recent U.S. wars, the counterinsurgencies in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is they're sending hundreds of thousands of troops to occupy Manchuria. The Chinese don't give up. It goes on and on and on. So by the time you're getting to 1945, it's a long time. Also, they had committed atrocities in China and they knew all about it. And the atrocities get even better. When there were wounded Japanese soldiers, their commanders ordered their fellow soldiers to execute them. 
because they didn't want cripples going home. They couldn't deal with them there. And so rather than have the allies pick them up, they executed them in place. You, can you imagine how Japanese soldiers felt about this? How do we explain the high morale, the, the, the famously high morale of the Japanese uh, military, where they would refuse to surrender even after given orders by their superiors, oh. b b despite knowing about um, these things that you're talking about? Uh, it's true. Um, it's because it's a different culture. So in Japanese culture, you belong to in-groups or out-groups. So the biggest in-group that Japanese belong to was Japanese people and everybody else. But within Japan, you come from a province, a locality, et cetera. You go school, education, various places. You belong to a job wherever you have, and there are various units within your job. And you owe loyalty. It's obligations. In the West, it's all about liberties and my rights. In the East, it's about obligations to other people. And so you owe obligations to all of these uh, organizations. And when they are, uh, soldiers are thinking about war, they're not thinking about grand strategy. They're thinking about operational success. So the moment you as a soldier start losing a battle, instead of in the West where you can retreat, you can surrender, and it's not dishonorable because you're going to live to fight another day. In Japan, you're a failure. And therefore, if you go and come home back as a failed soldier, you bring dishonor to yourself, your family, uh, your locality, anyone you are associated with. So that's why it is so difficult to, for them to surrender. However, by the time you get to the end of the war, they are so exhausted. Think about it. Their economy is, I don't know, I can't remember the statistics exactly. It's something like a tenth of our economy. They have something like a thirteenth of our, I can't remember this, coal or steel production. And they don't have any um, local oil production uh, they're importers of food and they're not getting that food. So by the time you get to 45, they're exhausted. And it's, um, it's a shattering that occurs. And um, finally, at the very end, you have Emperor Hirohito, who knew full well earlier if he disagreed, and he didn't disagree for a long time, that he would be assassinated or uh, be proclaimed deranged. And he had a perfectly good underage son to be used as a figurehead. He knew uh, that he couldn't do much about it. Uh, at the very end, when he decided he was about to get nuked, <laughs> that's when he intervenes to break the deadlock and at the cabinet meetings. And there are a, a, a variety of people at the very top who realizes it's over. Could Hirohito have intervened earlier? I doubt it. Let's go back more, more than five years. If he intervenes um, when uh, Japan is overextending in China, is there any chance that he could have succeeded? I doubt he uh, thought of Japan overextending in China. What expertise does he have? He liked guppies. He likes studying fish in his backyard. Uh, he has no expertise. And then, of course, there's the hubris of it all, that we're going to dominate this place. And they look at the Chinese as an absolutely feckless backward place that's had all these warlord things going on. And it doesn't dawn on them that by their extreme brutality in China, the Chinese finally get it going, uh, we're not the problem, the Japanese are the problem. And it is uh, what the Japanese do that super glues China and is the great impetus to na nation building. You can see parallels with Hitler doing the same thing in Russia and, and also right now um, uh, Putin's busy canonizing uh, Zelensky and uh, creating a real nation out of Ukraine that's never going to forget these ongoing events. Yeah. Well, what I learned from your book that I thought was really interesting and also tragic because of the counterfactual was one of the strategies you suggested could have been that Japan could have, if it thought like a continental power, it could have allied with the nationalist to beat the communist in Russia, maybe waged a, almost a three-front war with Germany, the nationalist, and Japan beat the communists and prevented the communists from taking hold in China. And given the consequences of communism in Russia and China and how many lives could have been saved if, you know, I guess Hitler was beaten and then the communists are beaten, that Japanese choice just seems so tragic. Let's say they do it. Uh, that means Hitler forever. And that means if you're anything but a nice Aryan, <laughs> uh, your days are numbered. Certainly, it would be the, have been the most massive ethnic cleanse ever in Europe.